by God's wonderful grace and mercy and through what he has been teaching us, we know we have been learning a lot. It is more or less the manual, the scriptural manuals, and every company has gotten their employee manual, the use, and in our case, our manual is the Holy Scriptures, and uh, by his wonderful uh, continuous grace, he has been teaching us the principles that we need to be following in preparing for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, and all the principles that we've gone through point to the fact that Christ is coming, and we need to watch and pray. We need to be ready. We need to uh, clean up. And we do it, right? When we are expecting someone, we clean, we vacuum, we do all these things, and uh, even take a shower, right? So to make sure that when the person comes or the guest comes, and we are all wonderfully refreshed. So as we reflect on Christ's return, we should be also doing the same preparing ourselves, cleaning up, removing anything from our hearts that will hinder us from Christ. As he has said, he is holy and we must be holy. So if you are expecting someone who is holy, what do you do? Don't you refresh yourself and clean up and do all those things? Well, if we can simplify it, we need to be removing any acts of the evil, anything that we know is not righteous, it's not good, it's not presentable. So may the Lord continue to help us so that every day we are refreshed, we are ready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we learned last week about God's seven feasts which is in our Lord Jesus Christ. So this Sabbath, we will continue with what we learned. And as we mentioned last time, let's mention it again. Passover happened this Tuesday, this past Tuesday. And uh, while the world celebrated uh, Easter, which is nowhere in the Holy Scriptures, we know God granted us the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of the Sabbath, the Lord of the Passover. He is the one who did everything for us. So here are the feasts, the seven feasts that God, or should we say, some will say holiday. We don't count it holiday. It's a feast. It's a celebration or um, guidance that God gave to the Israelites. We start from Leviticus. Chapter 23, and uh, starting from verse 1, and we want to see what God has uh, appointed and what God gave to the Israelites. What did he say? Verse 1 of Leviticus 23 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying to speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Three, six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath, of rest, a holy convocation, ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwelling. For these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. For a uh, five now, in the fourteenth day of the feast, uh, uh, verse 5 again, in the fourteenth day of the first month, 
at even is the Lord's Passover. Six, and on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. Verse 7. In the first day ye shall have a holy convocation. Ye shall do no several work therein. Verse 8. But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days in the seventh day is a holy convocation. Ye shall do no several work therein. Amen. So we see that God made this feast, this occasion for the Israelites to continue observing. And as we've said last time and think we'll repeat it again, the Israelites still celebrate this feast. And as we also mentioned, you know, the calendar, if you look at the calendar, you see there all the feasts that God has designed. So in our scriptures, we see what God has provided. And so as we have already read, we see that God made the commandment. The feast is something to be remembered. It is the feast that was given, which was the last plague. After the last plague, we know in Egypt, the last plague was when God said, after this last plague, you will be leaving Egypt. And they did. So when we reflect on it, we see that God made the provision for the Israelites so that they will remember what God did for them. We remember our birthdays. We remember all these things. We say, oh, well, this is it. And we glorify God and we thank God for that. So in this case, the Israelites were also encouraged to have the same wherein they can also celebrate. So the Passover, God passed over them. And God has passed over us because of what Christ has done for us. So while we reflect on this, let us remember that it is God's provision. And we also have it in Exodus 12. It's there. So we see God's love, God's kindness upon all of us. How do we reflect on it in the New Testament? When we go to John chapter 1, we find that there is a similar reference. And what does the reference say? It is reminding us of what Christ did. We go to John chapter 1, then verse 29 says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Do we see it? Amen. God already made the provision from the Old Testament and then in the New Testament we find what God has done. So when we look at the feast the Israelites still celebrate we find what God has already provided for us all so that when we remember it we know it is God's provision for us all wherein we continue to enjoy all the spiritual benefits that he has given to us. And then on the same level, 
we read verse um, 6 of Leviticus, but the reference, as we know, has to do with unleavened bread. Unleavened bread, this seventh day feast begins on the day following the start of the Passover. You see, the Israelites were uh, supposed to do all of these things or uh, to celebrate the unleavened bread. The unleavened bread, as we know, is the bread which didn't have any, they didn't ferment it, they didn't put all those things there, and it was made in a haste. They were hurrying to get out of Goshen, Egypt. And because of that, God said that was the last, you know, feast for them. They ate it in a haste. They were in a hurry to leave. And so, while we are not in a hurry to leave, we are really reflecting on what they did at that time when they had the unleavened bread, which is something that we need also to remember every time we have the unleavened bread. So this is really uh, wonderful for us. So when we remember the unleavened bread, it shows that the Israelites were in a hurry to leave because they had to leave because God had already given them the, should we say, uh, the freedom to leave and they were hurrying to get out and so they didn't uh, cook the bread the way they do. They didn't bake it the way they, they just made it in a hurry and that is fine. And so we should always remember it the same as they did. So the leavened bread was also, again, what we have just said. And so we also remember that uh, we are told, point out anything that is wrong from a clean up, and we should clean ourselves, clean our spiritual selves to ensure that we are able to uh, meet the Lord. And then what else? Then verse 10 of Leviticus 23 also provides what happened next. And that is called the first fruits. So in Leviticus 23 verse 10, we see what followed after the celebration of the um, event they had before when God gave them the Passover, the unleavened bread. So verse 6 tells us that, and on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of the unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. And they did that. And while we are not doing it for the seven days, whenever we have a Passover communion, we uh, remember that. So that is why the Israelites celebrated that. That is the unleavened bread. Now we talk about the first fruit, which is verse 10 of Leviticus 23, says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priests. Amen. So God was commanding them that when they start their harvesting, they were to bring their offering, the first fruit, to the priests. And what do we do in this modern life? We do our offering, tithe offerings, every time we receive our paychecks. So if God commanded the Israelites to observe this and give it to the priests, well, we in this uh, modern way are also considered priests 
or pastors or uh, should we say church elders. In this case, we also are granted the same provision of the tithe offering that the Israelites gave in those days. So now it is all to uh, the pastors and uh, those who minister unto the Lord. And so the first fruit, as we have read, is what God commanded. It's not like somebody made it. It's God's commandment, and it is something to be done. So uh, the, the priests sacrificed Passover lambs on the 14th day of the month of Nisan, which is in the middle of uh, the, uh, it is not January. We know it's in March, April, which we have said before. And the first day of the Passover was the 15th. So this was done by the Israelites. And we should remember what they have done. So it is all part of God's commandment. And so we go back and see what we have in First Corinthians 15 and uh, see the reference because it all points to everything that we celebrate nowadays. So 1 Corinthians uh, 15 and verse 20 says, It says, But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that sleep. So, amen. If God gave us the Lord Jesus Christ, he gave him to us so that he would be the one who would be the first fruit. And then, so the Old Testament points to the New Testament. So, that is all that we can always remember that it is God, which includes the resurrection, which includes all that God has given to us. So God wants us to enjoy all of these benefits of the Passover, unleavened bread, now the first fruit, and now the next feast of weeks, or in the New Testament, it is called Pentecost. And some people are called Pentecost, right? So back to Leviticus 23, and we'll see the reference again. Leviticus 23 and verse 16 says, Okay, I'll start from verse 15 of Leviticus 23. It says, And ye shall count unto you from the, uh, from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheep, the sheaf, S H E A F, of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Then 16, even unto the, mor uh, the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new feast of a new feast offering unto the Lord. Amen. And what does it reflect? Where do we get uh, that? We remember that when the Israelites celebrated this, now the Jews, uh, or should we say the apostles, we go to Acts chapter 2 and see what happened there. Acts chapter 2, point to the old pointing to the new, and the new also going back uh, to what they uh, did. And so, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Verse 2. And suddenly 
there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Who were they? These were the apostles. Do we see the reference that 50 days after the Lord Jesus Christ went to be with the Lord, what happened? The uh, well, when the Lord Jesus Christ went after, you know, he told them, wait, I wanted you all to remain in the same place. Don't go anywhere else. And now, what happened? He said what he promised them. And that was the Holy Spirit, the Feast of Pentecost. So in this case, we can see that 50 days is what the Israelites were supposed to celebrate. Now, 50 days again, when the Lord Jesus Christ went, uh, the apostles, what happened to them? Not, not only just the apostles, all those who were gathered in that upper room were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So do we see the reference of what God had uh, given to them? So that is why we have the Feast of Weeks, which is also called Pentecost. So if somebody is saying Pentecost, we know where that uh, comes from and we should not be uh, surprised. And so then, where else do we go? We go and see the other feasts. The fifth feast is the Feast of Trumpets, which is given to us in the same chapter of Leviticus 23. And this time we do verse... 24. Leviticus 23 and says 23 Leviticus and uh, 24 is coming up. So here is Leviticus 23, 24, which says, Speak, well, I'll start from 20, 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, 24, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. 25. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Amen. So we see the reference from the old into the new, and it's just wonderful what God has provided. So that is the fifth of the celebrations or events they were supposed to have. So this is the feast of trumpet. They were blowing. Just like, don't we see what people do uh, during the, what do you call it? Holidays? Independence? Then they blow, through people, uh, in the new year, people blow trumpets. God it was already there. And so God is reminding us of what we are to be doing, to be praising God, to be making offerings to God for what he has done for us all. Right? Amen? So then, what else? Uh, if we go to our scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, To the New Testament, First Corinthians fifteen and verse fifty two says First Corinthians fifteen fifty two says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, 
what happens? In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet or trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Amen. What God is referencing here is that in the Old Testament, when they were granted that freedom from Goshen, from Egypt, they left. Now, in the New Testament, God is reminding us that at the right time, when Christ is supposed to return, when he returns or when he's about to return, we will have this glorious opportunity. What will happen? We are told that the same way the Israelites blew the trumpet here in the new uh, world in which we are in, at the right time, when Christ is about to return, what will happen? He said it's in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So we've said it before. What is going to happen is that when Christ is returning, what will happen? All those who have passed on throughout the ages, throughout all these ages, what will happen? They are going to rise from the grave. I know some of them, they've used their blood, they've you know, entombed them so that all this cement, it's not going to have any effect. When God raises us up or those who are passed on, he's going to rise them up. Whether it's a, a ceiling, they've been sealed with bricks or whatever, or metal or iron, God is going to rise everybody up. Spiritually, they are going to be able to get out of wherever they are, and then those of us who are alive will then accompany them to meet the Lord in heaven, in the air, rather, as he says. And then wherever the Lord will take us to, we will uh, follow. Let me go back and read a little bit of this verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, to help us so that it will... Uh, grant us more insight into what we are talking again. First Corinthians 15, as we have been uh, told, and it is already in the scriptures, what is he saying? What is God telling us? Verse 51. Okay, I'll start from, yeah, verse 50. First Corinthians uh, 15, 5, 0, 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, I mean, we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. 54. For when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on incorruptibility immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory 55 O death where is thy sting O grave, where is thy victory? 56. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us 
the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. First Corinthians 15 and we have read from verse 50 to 58. Amen. And then we go to the sixth feast. What is the sixth feast? That is the day of atonement. And we go back to Leviticus and see what God wrote for us. Leviticus chapter 16 and uh, let's see to the other one, I think. Uh, Leviticus also. Um, let's do All right, Leviticus 23. Uh, let's do 26 to 32, which says Leviticus 23, 26 to 32 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, 27, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. 28. And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. 29. For whatsoever soul it be, that shall not be afflicted in that same day, ye, uh, he shall be cut off from among his people. 30. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. 32. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statue for ever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And 32, it shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even and upon even, uh, from unto even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. Amen. And that is the Old Testament reference of what God gave to the Israelites. And then uh, in the New Testament, what do we have? He says, let's go to Hebrews. 
Hebrews chapter 9. And verse 12 says, All right, I'll start from verse 11. It says, Hebrews 9, 11 and following, But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in one into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Do we hear that? Do we see what God provided? 12, 13 now. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to save the living God. Amen. So do we see how all of the Old and New Testament connect to what God has uh, done for us? And now the seventh feast. What do we get from the seventh feast? The seventh feast, we go back to Leviticus 23 and see what God wrote for us. Leviticus 23 and Start from 33, which says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, 34, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. 35, On the first day shall be a holy convocation, Ye shall do no servile work therein. 36. Seven days ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly, and ye shall do no server work therein. Amen. So, do we see what God has provided? He made all of this provision so that when we look at our Holy Scriptures, we see what God has done, and then we come to the uh, New Testament and find that Christ has done all of the work for us, and we reflect on all of this and say, wow, see what God has uh, done. So let us hear what he gives us in this New Testament. Matthew and chapter 1. And 23 says, And he came and dwelt 
in a city called Nazareth, that is, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, he shall be called a Nazarene. Amen. So that is all pointing to how when God tabernacle, the Lord Jesus Christ came to dwell uh, with us, to dwell in the flesh with all of us, he made that provision. And that is all about that. So then finally, let's go to Revelation and see what God has provided there. Revelation 21. Somebody said that they that they are too afraid to read Revelation. We need to be reading every part of the Holy Scriptures because they all point to Christ, point to what Christ has done for us. So Leviticus 21. All right, I think I'll start from verse 1. We actually need verse up to verse uh, 4, but let's see what it says. Leviticus 21. Pardon me. Revelation, the, book, the last book of the Holy Scripture. Revelation, we already read the Le uh, Leviticus, so now Revelation 21 and 1 following says, And I say, pardon me, again, Revelation 21, verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Two, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Three, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and, and women, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. For, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away five and he that said he that sat upon the throne said behold i make all things new and he said unto me, Write for the for, write for these words are true and faithful. Six and he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things and I will be with and I will be, pardon me, his God and he shall be my son and daughter. 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and uh, and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death amen that is revelation we have read and it is really wonderful 
what God is revealing to all of us. It is a wonderful message. We should have that peace of mind that what God has said will really happen. It is worth you know, looking at it again. What is God saying? Verse 3, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle, tabernacle of God is with men and women now. That's why God, God is not going to be living with us. We are going to be living with God, rather, I should say. Living with God and the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ and all of those who have gone ahead of us. And it is going to be wonderful. It is God's provision for us. God has made all of this for us. And I want to read it. And he will dwell with them or with us. And they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Verse 4. And God shall wipe away. What? All tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death. Do we hear it? Do we see it? Do we know? There's, there will not be any more death. There will not be any more tears. Because God is going to wipe all of this away. What else? Verse 4 again. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death. Neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. How? Verse 5. And, the, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Amen and amen. We thank God for what God has provided us today. It is just wonderful what God has prepared. And when we think again about the old feast, the Israelites celebrated when they left Goshen, Egypt, and gave them the promised land. In the New Testament, God has promised us more. And the fact that God is going to be dwelling with us, we are going to be seeing him every day. We are going to be worshipping with our Lord Jesus Christ and with all the holy men and women. Let us rejoice. Let us remain faithful to God. Let us also pray that those we know, our families, and even our enemies, will all be converted, will all receive Christ and enjoy the blessings that God has provided for us in his holy scriptures. Again, amen and amen and amen. We thank God for what he has granted us this Sabbath day. Let us kneel in prayer.